speaking yesterday at the uh, Parliamentary uh, uh, Building in Ottawa, Canada. Joining us now is Peter Brooks, Senior Fellow of National Security Affairs at the Heritage Foundation, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and a former U.S. Navy Commander. Hello, Peter. How are you, sir? Hey. Always good to talk to you. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, yesterday uh, it had us all mesmerized and I guess, you know, wondering how it could happen. You know, we had someone get to the White House here, how some lone gunman, as it turns out, could get into the Parliament building there. And um, this, this, this lone wolf, and I don't like that expression anymore. I really don't. We've got to come up with a better one. Uh, but look at, all, look at all the damage that one person could do. Well, we had actually had a couple of incidents. I mean, it, it barely got reported in the U.S. press, but uh, on Monday, uh, a, a similar sort of event took place. I don't know that they're related at all. We're still learning things, but a similar sort of event when took they, place. When the car ran down yeah, the soldiers. Yeah, the car. Yeah. They were, tried to run down two soldiers uh, and killed one of them. So, I mean, this is... Well, this, uh, well by the way, the same thing, ha the same thing happened in Jerusalem uh, yesterday, and that three-year-old American girl got killed when a, a Palestinian terrorist ran his car into a crowd. I hadn't even heard about that. I've been so focused on what has happened in uh, what yeah. happened in Canada. But obviously, I'm afraid this might be the new normal. Uh, you know, this this what's going on. We're living in an increasingly dangerous world. Uh, what uh, happens overseas? I don't I don't know all the specific yet, Steve. We still don't know all the specifics of what motivated this individual. But if the way things are leaning or accurate, I mean, I think that you know what happens overseas uh, it has a very good chance of affecting us here. And this just happened. You know, what is Ottawa, 50 miles from the American border? Uh, and we're under the same threat as happened in Canada. And a lot of people who have downplayed the chances for homegrown terrorism related to the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, I think, are making a big mistake. Well, the two questions. First of all, let me ask you what, I, what I've asked others, and I asked Congressman Ted Poe. Um, you know, they, they let that guy in the country. They kept him in Canada because he was deemed to be a travel risk because they thought he wanted to go to Turkey or somewhere and, and, and meet with terrorists or fight for terrorists. Why wouldn't we let, and we have the same policy in the U.S., according to Congressman Poe. Why don't we either, A, let them go and just make sure they, know they never come back, take their passport when they go on the plane, uh, or, and or, B, lock them up. I mean, putting them under surveillance, which obviously didn't work in Canada, and I would imagine you have trouble surveilling all these people. I mean, I have the same sort of concern you do, but I'm, uh, Steve, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, you know, I, I don't really, I mean, I hear what they say, you know, saying they don't have enough reason or a reasonable cause to, you know, do something with somebody, incarcerate them because of this sort of thing. Uh, so I have to leave that up to the lawyers, but I, I hope that Congress, like the, the Canadians are, will look at what we need to do to keep our, ourselves safe. And, of course, I'm not sure what the congressman said, but, you know, if you let somebody go overseas, you could certainly lose uh, track of them. Uh, but, you know, that's an interesting idea of taking their passport away from them. But that's kind of, you know, that's kind of beyond, uh, you know, what I'm, uh, you know, looking at in terms of the, th the threat overseas. So I, I kind of have to leave that up to the legislators and the lawyers and what's, uh, what's right for the country in terms of protecting civil liberties as well. No, no, yeah, and I wasn't talking from a legal perspective. I was just talking from, you know, it really doesn't make much sense. If yeah, no, a from a practical and, perspective, and I think that's, but I think, you know, obviously yeah. if you're going to do those sort of things, the authorities are going to do it, they're going to have to have some sort of legal basis for doing it. Right. But, but you say, interesting, Peter, you said the new normal, and I know what you meant, obviously. I, yeah. I, you don't mean it's going to happen every day. But, but no. so how do we, in your view, need to change here? Uh, Canada, too, but let's focus here. I mean, you, you said Congress is going to have to readdress laws to, to make sure that we, what, address the, what you call the new normal, correct? To make sure that we yeah, aren't could, subject to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, you know, like I said, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I think they have to look at this. I mean, there has to be some sort of review. Homeland Security is going to have to look at the lessons learned in Canada. It appears that their you know, security around their parliament was less than what we have here in, in Washington, so that's something. But I think, it, you know, these sort of tragic events – uh, should uh, spur us on into looking at the lessons learned to make sure that we're not doing that. But one of the things I'm saying is that I think you know, we really need to focus, take a hard focus on the Islamic State. I mean, I don't know that these things are connected yet. I, I just don't know that. But if my suspicions are correct, these individuals, because the Islamic State has come out and said, you know, kill Americans, Europeans, Canadians, Australians, or anybody else who's part of the coalition, um, I think we have to take this sort of social media uh, threats seriously, 
Um, and All right, we'll so what to, we got 30 seconds, Peter. Not to interrupt, we got 30. So yeah, what, what but I mean, I think we, we need to turn up the heat. I think we need to turn up the heat on ISIS. I mean, I think we have to address yeah. this, and we, I think what we're doing right now, we're pre pretty much at a stalemate. And it's going to continue to inspire people, whether it was related to what happened in Canada or not. But I think it's going to continue yeah. to inspire a threat. I got you. All right, Peter. Always great to talk to you, sir. Thank Thanks you very for much. Me. My pleasure. Peter Brooks, ladies and gentlemen, and we will continue with more of the Steve Malzberg Show with the Malzberg panel. Uh, but first, we're going to check in on the Alaska Senate race, and we're going to do that with our countdown to the midterms update coming up next right here on Newsmax Television. Republicans won Alaska back. Democrat Mark Begich took it from them in 2008 when he ousted the longest-serving Republican senator in U.S. history, Ted Stevens. But he's not going anywhere without a fight. Given he's a first-term senator who supported Obamacare in the state that didn't, Begich knew early on he'd be a target. To shrink the bullseye on his back, experts said he would need to run a serious, incredible campaign, something political analysts agree he's doing. In a state where Democrats are the underdog, any misstep could be detrimental. The one near slip when Begich tried to link himself to Alaska's senior senator, moderate Republican Lisa Murkowski, that backfired when she announced her support for his challenger, Dan Sullivan. Even with Begich's performance on the campaign trail, where he emphasizes local issues like homeland security and veterans affairs, Begich is beginning to slide in the polls to Sullivan, a lieutenant colonel in the United States Marine Corps. Sullivan's military status and agenda for veterans affairs could be a problem for Begich. The Associated Press reports Alaska is home to 35,000 stationed troops, and one out of every 10 residents is a veteran. Both are stumping hard for that vote with frequent visits to American Legion and VFW posts to lay out their plans for the last frontier. 